Amen. If you don't believe that song, just try it for yourself one time. All right. Just get down in the dumps. Just start praising the Lord. And by the time it's done, you'll be changed. All right. Everybody stand. Grab your hymn book 306. Hymn number 306. The old gospel ship. Hymn number 306. I have good news to bring. And that is why I sing all my joys with you. I share. Oh, I plan to take a trip in that good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring while I'm bidding this world goodbye. Oh, I can scarcely wait. I know I'll not be late, for I'll spend my time in prayer. And when my ship comes in, I'll leave this world of sin and go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring while I'm bidding this world goodbye. If you're ashamed of me, you have no cause to be, for with Christ I am an heir. If too much fault you find, you'll sure be left behind while I go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring while I'm bidding this world goodbye. Amen. Amen. Well, again, we welcome you to the service this morning. Good to see you in God's house on this uh, this beautiful June Sunday morning. Hard to believe how quickly this year is uh, is uh, passing by. I want to remind you, please pray for our young people. Our, uh, we'll be going to camp uh, this week, leaving early in the morning. So pray for their safety and travel and also God's blessing upon the preaching and activities there at camp. And during that same week, Miss Bambi and I are traveling up to Rochester. Minnesota for our grandson's uh, open heart surgery at Mayo Clinic there. And uh, so we covet your prayers on our behalf as well. We'll be gone from uh, this coming Tuesday through the following Tuesday. Have some good preachers lined up uh, for you while I'm gone. You'll enjoy uh, their ministry and looking forward to what the Lord does for us today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the good day that you've given us and the blessing to assemble together in this place at this time. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, would you give us ears to hear and hearts, Lord, to heed the word of God today. We pray for your blessing upon our uh, upcoming events. We think of our 
uh, young people that will be going uh, to camp. We pray for Brother Hewitt and those who will be working with him uh, in the camp. And just ask the Lord for your special touch and blessing upon each aspect of the services and activities there. Uh, we do pray for Caden and uh, his mom and dad and sister and Miss Bambi and myself um, as we uh, uh, have this uh, uh, occasion on on uh, on the docket for this week. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the doctors as they perform the surgery. Would you use them as instruments in your hand as our prayer? Give him help and healing. And Lord, we ask uh, this morning again for your blessing upon this service. Thank you for the choir and their willingness to give of themselves to sing the praises of God. Would you bless them as they sing for us today, as we sing congregationally, as we pray together, as we give together, as we gather around the Word of God. Lord, we want to dedicate this day to you. Ask your will to be done. Ask your blessing and help in every aspect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You be here. And uh, something a little different. If you got it, grab your hymn book and go all the way to the back cover, inside the back cover. Some have it and some don't. So if you don't, you're just going to have to wing it, all right? Uh, we're going to sing My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And uh, nice and loud. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. All right, if you don't have those words in your book, listen to those words. Man, what a love our Savior has for us as we sing it on verse 2. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity angels behold him and came from the world of light. To comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Paul, oh, listen to this on verse 4. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore my burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransom in glory, His face I at last shall see, Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. Nice and loud. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Great singing this morning.
you right there. Everybody stand. Grab your hymn book again. Turn to hymn number 339. We'll sing one verse and the choir will come down. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, 
I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. All right, while the choir comes down, everybody fellowship together. back to your seat on verse number four. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. On the rock of ages, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. Oh, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved Just like a tree that's planted by the water I shall not be moved All right, let's sing one more. You can be seated and turn to hymn number 348. A Child of the King, hymn number 348. My Father rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of man, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is pleading our pardon on high that we may be his when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, and heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. A tender, a hut, oh, why 
why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Amen. All right. One announcement real quick. Uh, cookies and toys for Vacation Bible School. Uh, it's coming up at the end of the month. So uh, we need cookies and we need toys. And if you have any questions, you can just see me uh, and uh, or Pastor Medford and he'll point you to me. So either way and uh, no choir tonight. But Bethel Boys Senior, you know who you are. If you have practice at 
sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul's sad cry. Oh, hallelujah, I have found him who my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood I now am saved. Well, Bread of life so rich and free. I'm so wealth and never failing. My Redeemer is to me. Oh, right on time my Jesus he's always on time and though you may see a valley he sees the mountain you'll be standing on when all you can see are the tears flowing down I'm so glad he sees what we don't. I've seen God's children walk through darkest midnight. I witness faith put to the test. I've watched as the storms blew under. In each trial, he knows what's best. And I'm so glad. And though you may leave, the you'll be standing on when all you can see are the tears flowing down. I'm so glad he sees what we don't. He knows the end from the beginning. He looks ahead past the hurt and the pain To a place where the peace passes all understanding He sees the sun through the rain And though you may see a valley He sees the mountain you'll be standing on when all you can see are the tears flowing down, I'm so glad he sees what we don't. All right, thank you.
John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'll read just one verse of Scripture, but I would encourage you to keep your Bibles open. In John chapter 13, we begin Jesus' last discourse with His disciples as He makes His way toward Gethsemane and then, of course, to the cross. And uh, there is a phrase at the end of the first verse of John chapter 13 that has captured my thoughts and my heart, and I want to share a message that the Lord has uh, directed me to in that regard. In John chapter number 13 and verse number 1, we see these words, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour was come, that He should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved His own which were in the world, He loved them unto the end. Uh, the title of the message, the thrust of the message today is that statement, He, Jesus, loved them unto the end. Uh, we really get a better idea about what love really is from our text verse here. Jesus was committed to His disciples even though they would falter and flounder and forsake and fail Him in His greatest hour of need. He's getting ready to go through the deep waters of Gethsemane and uh, His uh, sweat is going to become as uh, drops of blood because of the pressure and stress that's upon Him and His disciples that He's encouraged to help Him pray through this. He'll go back three separate times and find them instead of praying one hour with him asleep because they themselves are overcome with sorrow and with the issues that are upon them. And uh, I say to you this morning, what an amazing statement that he loved them unto the end. I'd like to make the application and say to you this morning, Jesus didn't stop loving people unto the end on this occasion. I'm glad that I can announce to you no matter where you are in life, he will love Love you unto the end. I am certainly not denying the feelings or emotions that are often associated with love, but I am saying that we often lose that loving feeling all too quickly because it was not based upon commitment. I'm glad that when what the Bible's talking about Jesus loving his disciples to the end, it's not talking about just having this queasy feeling. It's not just talking about uh, uh, something uh, superficial, but it's talking about deep down in his innermost being, he was was committed to do what would be best for his disciples. He was committed to them in this sense of an undying love. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, one of the most well-known Bible verses and often quoted verses, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We see the greatest person for God. We see the, the greatest passion so loved the world. We see the greatest presentation that He gave His only begotten Son. We see the greatest prospect that whosoever, what an amazing prospect that anyone who hears the glorious message of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Savior, hears about the gracious God of heaven that so loved them that He gave His only begotten Son, and He gave Him not only to be born in a manger, but to die upon a cross and to bear our sin debt upon Calvary. What an amazing prospect that by faith that whosoever can believe in Him. The next phrase says exactly that, believeth in Him. That's the greatest plan ever devised. Aren't you glad this morning that God's plan of salvation is so simple and straightforward? He that believeth on Him. Uh, there's uh, uh, man uh, um, complicates the Scripture, complicates salvation salvation, complicates things, and said, boy, you know, there's these 99 things, and if you hit on them all just perfectly, uh, God might take note of you and save you. And the Bible says, no, you're not going to be able to do everything just right. And as a matter of fact, you're a sinner in need of a Savior, like we've heard testified of in song this morning. And uh, so Jesus uh, and our Father in heaven make salvation available simply on believing on Him, the greatest plan ever devised to bring salvation to a soul should not perish the greatest promise ever given. 
and but goes on to say but have everlasting life the greatest possession you could ever receive I often mention to folks that I witness to that Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 separates Bible Christianity from all other religious pursuits uh, it doesn't matter what denomination it doesn't matter matter what name tag it doesn't matter if it's an Eastern religion or a um, new world religion uh, all religions fall into one of two camps either believing that our salvation is based upon what Christ did and has already accomplished upon Calvary or it's based upon what we can do uh, you're either in one of those belief systems it, it may have a lot of different manifestations but at the heart of religion is either the old time religion of Jesus Christ and salvation through the blood shed on Calvary and his glorious resurrection or there is the religion of man that says I'll make myself acceptable to God I'll do enough good deeds that I can get to God I'll climb into heaven on my own that verse says this but God commendeth his love toward us listen to this now in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us all other religious pursuit says I am going to shine myself up I'm going to turn over a new leaf I'm going to be so good that I get this great God's attention and he's going to forgive me and the Bible just makes the assumption that is true that you're not as good as you think you are that you are a sinner that falls short of the glory of God that there is none righteous no not one and you need a savior and uh, because of that God God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were in Sunday school, not while we had our uh, everything just right in our lives, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a wonderful truth that Jesus doesn't wait for you to get good enough for him to love you. He loves you just like you are. Now I'll give you this. He loves you so much that you can come to him just as you are, but he loves you so much that he will not leave you where you are. If you come to Him in faith believing, He will save you. He will give you a life worth living and a life worth loving. Would you bow with me in prayer and pray with me and also for me this morning that God would help us in the time that we have here around the Word of God. Heavenly Father, again we bow and thank you for a good day. I thank you for these young ladies that have sung for us this morning their testimony of God's grace in their lives. Lord, I pray that you'd use them for your honor and glory, even as you have in our midst this morning. I thank you for the talents that you've given them, and I pray that you'd put a hedge of protection about them and use them in a, in a wonderful way. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our service this morning. Lord, we come as needy people uh, listening to learn from heaven. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts. And may it go past our ears uh, and deep into our hearts. May we not only have ears to hear, but hearts to heed the word of God this morning. Would you stir us and help us and guide us and bless us is our prayer. Lord, for the needs that weigh heavy on our hearts this morning, those who have sickness and problems, and issues of life, I pray, God, that you'd give them grace for every need. Grace for this hour. And Lord, we realize that the great apostle, when he professed your grace being sufficient in his life, he did not say that the grace of God was sufficient. He did not say that the grace of God would be sufficient. But he said in the present tense, your grace is sufficient. And I pray this morning that someone, Lord, would come to you and find your grace sufficient this morning to save them, though they don't deserve salvation. Grace sufficient to help them in the trials of life. Grace sufficient to bear the burdens that you allow in their hearts and lives. Lord, would you bless us and help us this morning is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I specifically ask Brother uh, Josh to sing that song that is pasted into the back of some of our songbooks. I hope that you had that in the one, the songbook that was near you. The words to the Charles Gabriel hymn, My Savior's love, often referred to by the first phrase of the song that says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned 
unclean. For me it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of light to strengthen him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. And that exuberant chorus resounds, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. What a song from the pen of Charles Gabriel. Many preachers before me have made the observation that the Lord Jesus Christ deserves someone that will love Him back the way He loves them. And uh, I agree with their analysis. I, I think that those who have experienced the grace of God in salvation ought to invest the rest of their lives, all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength in loving God supremely. And and uh, in that respect, we know that Jesus loved us sacrificially. He loved us steadfastly. And He loved us with a strong love. He loved us strongly. Loving the Lord never leaves you like you were. And so this morning, for a few moments, I'd like to suggest to us that uh, we need the constraints of the love of Christ in our life. And we need to uh, love for Christ. And uh, when we realize the, the Lord's great love, love for us and begin to express and experience the love that we should have for Him, I believe it produces some wonderful byproducts. And we'll just kind of take a survey of this last great discourse from John 13 uh, through 16. So keep your Bible open and turn to these passages and look at them with me if you would this morning. First of all, the love of Christ for us and our love for Christ produces fellowship. Look Look in chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse number 23. There Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. I'd like to say first of all this morning that love, the love of Christ and love for Christ produces fellowship. This wonderful family fellowship expressed in the words of Jesus. He says, if a a man loves me, he's going to keep my words, and uh, my father and I are going to come to him and abide with him. There's going to be this wonderful sense of family fellowship uh, when we uh, experience the love of Christ and when we begin to try to love him back the way he loves us. Fellowship with the Father and the Son. Look also in chapter 14, back at verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, verse 17, explains that He's speaking of the Holy Spirit. So not only is there fellowship with the Father and the Son, there's fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus, of course, is trying to comfort them, and He says, the Father's going to send another comforter. Hey, men, just like you've had me here with you physically, the Holy Spirit is going to come to you spiritually and dwell within you, and you'll have fellowship through Him and uh, with the Father and with me. In verse 26, he goes on to explain and say, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. There's probably, we owe the New Testament Scriptures to that promise that the Holy Spirit would move upon men to write the things that they remembered about the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Luke would take up the pen again to pen uh, Acts as far as the human penmanship is concerned. And he would say, I'm going to continue to write to you, Theophilus, about what Jesus began both to do and to teach. And now it's not Jesus physically uh, there, but it's Jesus ministering and in fellowship with His disciples, continuing 
continuing to do the things of God and continuing to teach the Word of God. What an amazing thing that when we experience the love of God in salvation, uh, in salvation and we begin then to love Christ as we should, we experience this wonderful sense of fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. But it goes further. We also experience fellowship one with another. Look back with me at chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. Jesus says as he uh, is instructing his disciples and trying to give them foundational fundamental truths that they'll be able to cling to in their hour of sorrow and suffering. He says a new commandment give I unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. So the, the Lord Jesus broadens this fellowship and says, man, uh, when you begin to respond to my love and you get saved and then you begin to want to love me back like I love you, you're going to enjoy fellowship with God the Father and with me, God the Son, and with God the Spirit. And that fellowship is then going to branch out and, uh, and embrace others who also enjoy that fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, in uh, chapter 15 of John's Gospel and verse 12, we find uh, again this statement, This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Certainly if we're supposed to love one another as Jesus loved us, we ought to love Jesus as He loved us. That's kind of the crux of my message that the love of Christ constrains us to love Him back. And, uh, uh, and uh, in 1 John, uh, John's uh, commentary after years of serving God, after years of meditating upon the truths of the Gospels. Uh, in 1 John, he writes these words in chapter 4 and verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Very practical aspect to John's theology there. and says, man, you're professing to by faith love a God you haven't seen and you're not uh, evidencing that love for him in your love for your brother. And so this broad fellowship, this, this embracing, and, and listen, love is not an anything goes proposition. Anyone who knows anything of love in the truer sense of the word knows that love is not releasing constraints. It is bringing constraints. When a young couple comes to the marriage altar and pledges their lives to one another, they're not taking down the constraints. They're raising the wall higher on constraints. And I'd like to say this morning, when the Lord loved you and saved you, He wasn't loving you and saving you so that you could spend the rest of your life loving you and loving the world and loving the things uh, that would take you away from Him. He saved you and loved you so that you could have the liberty to love Him back. Oh, we're set free by the love of God not to do our own thing, but to worship and honor and love and serve Him. Boy, the two things that are tied together unmistakably in the Bible are worship and service. When the devil tempted Jesus, he said, if you'll just fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. You can bypass bloody Calvary. You don't have to do all that. Man, I'll give you the, the world if you'll worship me for a moment. Jesus said, no, I know the principle of God here. The, and God's word says, thou shalt not worship, uh, that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus unmistakably understood that to worship, to bow down, to honor Satan was to serve Satan. Can I tell you, to worship God is to serve God. To worship God is not just an outward expression. It's not a performance that we put on on Sunday morning. It is to be a heart issue. And so the love of Christ produces fellowship one with another. Fellowship with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. Number two, love for Christ. Experiencing the love of Christ and salvation through His work on Calvary and then loving Him because of that. Uh, John said it this way. We love Him because He first loved us. I mean, uh, we have people today wanting God to step forward as if they have God in a, as like a jack-in-the-box to spring
bring forward and show his love for him. I'm telling you, God's already proven his love when he gave his son on Calvary. Jesus is not on trial. You and I are. It's not, does God love us? I'm saying this morning it is, do you and I love God like we should? He proved his love. He laid his life down. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. What about a Savior that would lay down his life while I was yet a sinner? What about a Savior that would take my sin debt on his shoulders on Calvary and let him beat his black back raw, bleed and suffer and have nails hammered through his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns beat down on his head? What about a Savior like that? Does he not deserve someone like me or and you to love him back? I know we can't ever reach that uh, level. We can't love him exactly like he loved us, but I'd like to go to my grave making a good run at it. And I'd like to go to my grave saying, Lord, I'd like to love you. You told me to love my other brethren as you loved us. Lord, I'd like to love you like you loved us. Amen? For love for Christ produces friendship. I like this one. In John chapter 15, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus has just said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he said to his disciples, These guys that would deny him, these fellows that would flounder and fall out by the wayside, these guys that couldn't pray with him one hour, he said to them, You're my friends. Ye are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Boy, that fellowship that we enjoy, it just deepens into friendship. And the Lord says, it's not just going to be like a master-servant relationship. You're going to be my friend. I'm going to be able to give you everything that the Father has given me. And boy, that's one of the things he prays in his great high priestly prayer that comes in John 17. He says, Lord, I have delivered to them what you gave me. I have given these men everything you intended for me to give them. And what a blessing that uh, loving the love of Christ produces friendship. Our love for Christ develops that friendship. And that friendship is proven by what? If you love me, uh, let's get it straight here. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Uh, don't profess friendship with Christ when you have no concern about what he wants you in your life. The, the way to prove our friendship with, with the Lord is to get our nose in the book and find out what he wants us to do and get busy about honoring those desires. Look at verse number 13. We know it applies to our Savior. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, we know that that certainly is fulfilled in the life of our Savior, but shouldn't we love him enough to die to self and die to sin and give him someone that would love him back in a similar fashion as he so greatly loved us? The Apostle Paul endeavored to do that. He says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Paul laid down his life. He had a religious... Um uh, ministry, if you will. He had a religious hold. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was the up and coming one. He was something to behold when it came to religion. And he laid it down. He said, all those things I counted as gain, my religious heritage, my family background, everything that I had to gain, I counted loss that I might win Christ. He literally laid down his life for his friend. He loved Jesus enough to die to self. He said then, you say, well, that sounds morbid. You uh, crucify yourself. Man, that, that sounds like a horrible way to live. But listen, the verse goes on. Nevertheless, he says, I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life that I now live I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me you get the picture here when we 
die to self, when we say Jesus is worthy of me going away, it's not like our life becomes a hardship and harsh and, and, uh, and a burden. Then we get to see Jesus live His life in and through us. I'm glad that the love of Christ on Calvary produces fellowship, that our love for Christ produces friendship, that the love of Christ on Calvary and our love for the Christ of Calvary produces fruitfulness. If you look at John chapter 15, Jesus gives a great discourse, probably using the grape orchards that they were passing by on their way down, passing down through the Kidron Valley to go up to uh, the mount there, the side of the mount, the Mount of Olives, and uh, finding their place there in Gethsemane's garden. On their way, they're going to pass these vines that are producing grapes, and he's going to use that as a backdrop and say that, boy, that's my design for my friends. That's my design for folks who are in fellowship with me and love me. Fruitfulness implies growth and maturing. You think about it. You plant a grapevine this afternoon, you don't pick grapes from it tomorrow. Uh, uh, most all of our fruitful plants, uh, we understand there is a process of growth and maturity that brings them to the place of fruitfulness. What is Jesus saying as he says to his disciples? Now, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You got to abide in me so that we have this reciprocal love and abiding fellowship and friendship so that I can produce my fruit through you. And he's, he's suggesting that he wants them to grow and mature into fruitful Christians. Fruitfulness also implies fulfilling our purpose, reaching our potential. Why do you plant a grape uh, vine? Why do you have a grape orchard? The very purpose is so that you can enjoy the fruit of the vine. And Jesus is saying, uh, this is part of my design. I want you to produce fruit. I want you to be a fruitful Christian. Fruitfulness also involves soul winning, sanctification, and supplication. Uh, at least those three areas. We know that the specific application of a fruit tree or fruit vine producing fruit is a picture of a Christian bringing forth another Christian, winning someone to Christ, influencing someone with the gospel, and seeing them saved and brought into the fellowship of the gospel and friendship with Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that it involves that aspect, but it also involves sanctification. There are two words that are used in relation to fruitfulness in the New Testament other than uh, uh, souls being saved. And those two words are holiness and righteousness. I've chosen the word sanctification to represent those two themes and thrusts. In other words, this idea of the grapevine, Jesus is saying, I want my life produced through you and that is going to bring uh, 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 fruitful the fruit of holiness that is going to bring the fruit of righteousness in your life. And then supplication. In the book of Hebrews, we read these words, that uh, the fruit of our lips unto Him giving thanks. Oh, I use the word supplication to stay with S's there with soul winning and sanctification and supplication. Oh, uh, I'm saying to you, doesn't Jesus deserve somebody to be thankful to Him? Doesn't He deserve some family somewhere to get up in the morning and gather around the Word of God and sing a hymn of, of uh, thanksgiving and express in their prayers, Oh God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for our home. Thank you for our food. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our church. Oh, we need to be thankful people. The love of Christ produces that fruitfulness the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. It produces holiness and righteousness. It produces uh, our efforts in soul winning. And really, our efforts in soul winning are really not efforts at all. They're surrender to Him producing fruit through us. Number four, the love of Christ and love for Christ produces fellowship. Notice with me in chapter 13 and uh, look at verses 15 through 17. Jesus has just washed their feet. You remember that little interchange with Peter? Peter said, no, Lord, you're not going to humble yourself and do that for me. Uh, and Jesus said, now, wait a minute, friend. Uh, 
uh, you're not in charge here. I'm going to tell you, I am going to wash your feet, and I'm going to teach you a principle in it, uh, Peter. Uh, you need daily cleansing. You don't need the full bath. You've already gotten saved, but on day to day, you're going to get your feet dirty, so you need to come and get cleaned up. A uh, pretty good little picture story for us there about maintaining our fellowship and friendship and fruitfulness for the Lord. But fellowship, uh, notice with me there. Uh, um, uh, and uh, he says in those verses, after he washes their feet, uh, he says, if I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done, for, uh, done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Let me point out something to you this morning. It strikes me, I find Jesus is so practical in his teaching. If you know these things, happy are ye is where we want to end that verse. If I know God's will, I'll be happy. If I know about the Bible, I'll be happy. Do you know some of the saddest people in the world know much about the Bible? Some of the saddest people in the world can tell you what God's will is, usually for your life, not their own. Do you realize what Jesus said? He doesn't say, if you know these things, happy are you. He says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. In other words, the happiness of the equation comes when we involve ourselves in fellowship. And here's a great point of fellowship in humility and service. He's just done a very lowly type service. This is the lowest man on the totem pole in the among the family servants gets a sign, hey, wash these dirty guests. They're coming in. Wash their feet. Uh, I mean, this is something that the, the disciples are struck by the fact that their master is willing to do. If I our master was willing to be a servant. You reckon you and I couldn't give ourselves to hand out a gospel track for a master like that? You reckon we couldn't humble ourselves and take a little guff because we're those old time Bible believing Christians that love the Lord and profess uh, the salvation and how wonderful it is to be cleansed by the blood of Christ? You reckon we couldn't just let some of the world stuff roll off of our back like uh, water off a, a duck's back because we know we're following following the Savior. We're following Him in His humility, following Him in His sense of serving and honoring others. Obedience is where that comes from. In uh, John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Fellowship involves simple, straightforward obedience. What is it that God wants me to do? Here's how to simplify your life. Uh, a lot of things call for your attention. I'm going to suggest this morning that you prioritize those things that you're commanded to do by God. Do you realize that most of what makes up our daily schedule, God never commanded? If we would reprogram our lives and reprioritize our lives and start getting our lives in order with God, I think we'd be amazed how everything else would come into line. I, I'm not saying we're ever going to uh, have all our little ducks in a row and never have a problem, but I'm saying you and I'd do a whole lot better if we get consumed and concerned about what God commanded us to do. Hey, husbands, God did command you to love your wife. I don't think He commanded you to have a hobby. Man, getting quiet in here now. Maybe I better get over and preach on the wife side of that. Hey, wives, he did command you to be in subjection to your own husband. I don't know that he commanded you to buy every dress that uh, Bells has on sale this week. <laughs> Oh my, you're a hard crowd this morning, <laughs> I tell you. Uh, all right, but obedience, you, you get the point? Uh, there are things that God literally commands us to do, and we're like, who cares about that? Oh, we ought to care about that, because if we love Him, we want to keep those commandments. How am I going to express my love to Him if I don't know what He commanded? I want to know what He commanded so that I can love Him more. You can't love Him more. Love in this sense is not just a gushy feeling. <laughs> It's not just a superficial thing. It's a deep down desire to follow Him in obedience, in humility, in serving. In chapter 14 and verse number 12, it says,
says, Verily, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. This is right in the context of the Holy Spirit being given. And uh, I think what Jesus is saying, we kind of struggle with that. Well, wait a minute. How are we going to do, how are the disciples going to do greater things than Jesus did? I don't think he's talking about uh, uh, in, in the sense of uh, more outwardly astounding, but I think he's talking about the things that he wants to get done. Jesus, on purpose, constrained himself to a literal human body. Now, you want to boggle your mind and cause your little theological wheels to, to smoke a little bit? You just uh, explain to me how the God who created the universe was stepped down and condescended to be born as a baby in a manger. I know the truth of it. I'll preach you the truth of it. And I have no, uh, uh, no problem professing the greatness of it. But I'm saying it boggles my mind. How in the world could God contain himself? And, and uh, and yet he did. He lived his whole life in dependence upon the Father. You remember the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees attacked him off and said, well, where, where, where do you get this doctrine? Where, where's this stuff? And sometimes they were amazed. Never a man spake like this man. How does he have all this wisdom and truth? And Jesus said, hey, I am not telling you what I think. I am hooked up directly with God the Father, and I'm just telling you what the Father told me to tell you. Boy, if our Savior, God in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16 says that very thing, that God was manifested in the flesh. Our Savior was God in the flesh. But in His surrender, in His submission to the Father's will and plan, if He so lived His life so dependent on the Heavenly Father, don't you reckon you and I need to love Him enough to let Him be in charge of our lives. Amen? Uh, loving Christ produces fellowship and obedience, humility, serving. And in this one, good works. Jesus said, you're going to do more good works. You're going to do greater works than I did. Why? Because now, instead of being uh, limited to one body, the Holy Spirit is going to have little Christ everywhere. That's what they experienced in Acts chapter 11, where believers were first called Christians there. It's like, man, we've got these little Christ everywhere. Everywhere we turn, they're talking talking about their Savior. They're loving the, uh, the Savior. They're expressing His love to us. Man, we've got these Christians doing more good works because now the Lord ought to have a tool in every household. The Lord ought to have an option in every home and every church and every uh, group and every place. Uh, we ought to be doing greater works just simply because the Holy Spirit would use us. That's fellowship. We follow the Lord to do good works. And in persecution, I won't read the verses, but in chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, Jesus mentioned, said, hey, fellas, now let me remind you, you're, gonna, you're getting ready to see the hatred of this world for your Savior evidenced in a big way. They're going to nail me to a cross. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat my back off. They're going to hammer a crown of thorns down into my skull. It's going to get ugly, fellas. And by the way, don't expect a whole lot better than your master. It may get ugly in your lives. Uh, Eleven out of the twelve original apostles, according not to the Bible, but according to uh, that which we know outside of Bible, uh, um, died martyrs' deaths. Uh, uh, John uh, was uh, boiled in oil. They they tried to kill him, and he was <laughs> he must have been a Baptist preacher. He was so tough he just wouldn't die. Amen. And uh, uh, but uh, boy, he Jesus warned them persecution's coming. In this world ye shall have persecution, he goes on to say, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. <laughs> and uh, so I'm saying love for Christ produces fellowship, and then love for Christ produces fullness. Fullness. I mentioned this, I've hinted at it from the very beginning. We get this impression, oh, if I become a real true uh, believer and love God supremely, man, that's going to cramp my style. I'm not going to be able to do this, and I'm not going to be able to go there. 
<laughs> oh my, what a weird uh, uh, view we have of things. I'm telling you, if you get right with God and get on board with God and get full of God and full of the things of God, you're not going to care about those stupid things that you thought you couldn't live without. <laughs> you're going to be so in love with Him, you're going to be like a young man waiting for his marriage day. Amen? Uh, you, you're going to be like a, um, Simon Norton. Amen? You, you're going to be like a, a Shelton Roslin. Amen? I, I mean, uh, those guys, I, 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 can, I can guarantee you, I can promise you right now this morning, you say, well, those fellows are in church this morning. I know. And you know what's on their mind? A certain young lady. <laughs> A certain young lady has captured their affection, has captured their concerns, has captured their heart. And shouldn't we love the Lord like that? Shouldn't we let Him just be the thought on our mind? Oh, love for Christ produces fullness. Fullness of peace. In John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God the Father. You, you understand. You know that. Well, believe also in me, God the Son. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Uh, later in the chapter, in verse 27, He reminds them of the persecution. He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm glad there's fullness of peace. There's freedom from agitation. There's a calm repose. It, uh, peace is not being worried or fearful, even under the worst of circumstances, but trusting God in spite of the circumstances. There's a fullness of peace. There's a sense in which the Christian can live in the fullness of peace in the midst of a troubling world. Amen? And uh, fullness of love. We mentioned this prior uh, in chapter 15 verses 9 and 10. Uh, Jesus expresses this love that would guard and guide our lives. There's a fullness of joy in chapter 14 and verse 28. In chapter 15 and verse 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you. Uh, Jesus had some disciples like we have children. Amen? He's going to have to tell them what he's been telling them or why he told them what he told them. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You get it? Jesus is talking about persecution coming. He's talking about going to Calvary. And he said, but I'm telling you all this stuff, fellas, so that you understand that is not to wreck and ruin your joy. That's to give you a joy the world knows nothing about. That's not to make you agitated and on edge and worry, worrisome. That's to give you a peace that passes understanding. Because you have the peace with God through salvation, now you can enjoy the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Oh, thank God for the uh, fullness of joy, the passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good. That's how the dictionary defines joy. Uh, that, that passion uh, that's excited by the expectation of good. They were going to see a lot of bad, but Jesus is programming, programming them to think, in my Father's house or many mansions, you got a great expectation. Regardless, fellas, of what happens to you in this world, man, it just does get better than this for you. And uh, the, the fullness of joy is being glad because we have faith in God regardless of the circumstance of life. Boy, how we let the world jerk us around with circumstances. Oh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't like what's going on politically. I, I, I'm agitated and I don't have any peace and my joy is gone. Well, shame on you. Your peace and joy never was dependent on who's in the White House. Your peace and joy and your love never should have had its anchor in a political party. It should have been your love, the love of Christ that saved you. And then you saying, Lord, I want to love you back like you love me. And then there's fullness of the Holy Spirit in chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Uh, uh, the Bible says this, And I will pray the Father, it's the words of our Savior, saying to His uh, original disciples there, I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. In other words, He's saying, you're going to have help just like you've had me. It's going to be different. It's going to be a spiritual um, manifestation rather than a physical. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is going to plug in, and you're going to be okay. 
uh, another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. We know from the epistles, we know from the teaching of the New Testament uh, about how God designed this, and that now, whereas in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon men and leave them like Samson, uh, like Gideon, like various different ones. Now, he says, this, this is a whole different uh, dispensation, a whole different way of operating. The Holy Spirit that's been with you is going to be in you. He's going to, uh, your body is going to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. So there's the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So, the love of Christ produces fellowship, friendship, fruitfulness, fellowship, fullness. Let me remind you this morning that the question of love, as I said early on, is not on Jesus' side of the equation this morning. He has already proven His love. I like the way the Apostle Peter put it. You know, Peter's the one that Jesus recovered for the ministry. Peter had blown it. He... He denied the Lord three times. You remember that? Oh, man. He goes out weeping bitter tears as he looks into the face of Jesus and, and realizes, good night. Just a moment ago, I was saying, I'll go to the death. I'll go to prison with you, Lord. And here I am. Saying, I, I, blank, 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 blank. I don't know the man. And Peter just feels crushed and he feels useless. He feels like he's forsaken the Lord. He'll never be able to be used again. But Jesus shows up and says, You want back in fellowship, big boy? All you got to do is love me. Lovest thou me more than this stuff? Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Oh, by the way, that's how you get qualified to be saved. You got to put yourself on the right, right side of that equation. As long as you're the just and you're the good little person that doesn't need salvation, Jesus said, I'm sorry, but I came for the sick folks. I came for the unjust folks. I came for those who know they're about to go out into a Christless eternity and they need a Savior. So I didn't come for well people. I didn't come for folks who presume themselves to be able to get to heaven without me. You've got to put yourself on the right side of the equation. The just, that's Jesus. For the unjust, that's us. He once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. I find a lot of people today that would like to have an easy trip to heaven. Give me a free trick ticket to heaven, but don't bring me to God. Let's not get too spiritual here. Let's let's not get too let's not bring any constraints upon me. Just just give me the free pass and uh, don't don't affect me. Don't bother me. But just I want the free. I'm sorry. But if you don't see yourself as unjust in need of the just one who suffered for your sins, if you don't see yourself as being, needing to be brought back into a right relationship with God. The Lord's not going to twist your arm and save you against yourself. Being put to death in the flesh, that's what happened at Calvary, but quickened by the Spirit. Oh, I love it, don't you? Uh, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. I want to remind you this morning that salvation is just a prayer away. No, you, you can't just repeat some words and glibly say something, go through a religious ritual and be saved. But if like a little publican one day whose heart was broken and wouldn't even lift up his head toward, toward the Lord or toward the altar, and he simply cried out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, you could be saved. Prayer would only be a prayer away. Salvation would only be a prayer away. If, like the thief on the cross, you could see Jesus, and at first you railed with the other thief. Hey, man, if you're God, why don't you save us all? And if you're who you say you are, what? And then in the midst of that conflagration, he begins to see Jesus praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He sees the grace of the Savior, and he sees that Jesus is dying a different way. And he says to his fellow thief, Hey, hey, shut up. Don't you see that? He's different. And he turns to Jesus and he doesn't pray a sinner's prayer. He doesn't say the words like we would like him to express. He just says simply, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus saved him and said, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
Oh, what did he do? Get baptized? Oh, what did he do? Run a church bus route? Oh, what did he do? Give more money than anybody else? No, he trusted Jesus Christ. He got saved by the grace of God on Calvary. He saw Jesus dying for his sins and trusted him. If you know that you've been saved this morning, not by your works or goodness or religion, but by the precious blood of Christ, His suffering once for sins, isn't it time for a renewal of vows? Isn't it, isn't it about time? You know, uh, married folks do that sometimes. They get married 40, 50 years and they think, oh, man, we better redo this thing. It's about to fall apart. Now, I, I don't know if that's the reason that folks do that or not. Hopefully not. Hopefully it's just a joyous remembering saying, hey, here we are 40 years later. You're still the one, honey. Hey, I still want to be with you. I still am committed to you. Uh, and uh, isn't it about time that some of us just go to an old-fashioned altar and pour our hearts out to God and say, Lord Jesus, you're still the one. You're still my Savior. You're still the one that loved me when nobody else did and did for me on Calvary what no one else could do. Isn't it about time some of us make a renewal of vows? Isn't it time for you to step up your devotion? Isn't it time for a deep fellowship with Jesus? Isn't it time that Jesus gets more than just the leftovers of life? Doesn't He deserve our friendship and the priority that we give to a friend? Uh, will you determine this morning to bear fruit for Him? Will you fully commit to follow Him in obedience and sacrifice and humility and service? Uh, oh, don't you want the fullness that loving Him brings? Wouldn't that be the way to live? Wouldn't that be a good testimony to a lost and dying world? Christians just in love with Jesus. A.W. Tozer said it many years ago. Someone kept pestering him. Well, well how would you define revival? How would you refine, define revival? And he finally came to this simple statement. He said, revival is simply falling in love with Jesus all over again. Say, man, I, I, need, I need new life in my Christian service. Fall in love with Jesus again, and you'll get it. Oh, I, I need a new um, outlook on my devotional life. I, I need it to be fresh and real to me again. Well, just get to the altar and get real with Jesus, and your devotion life will start picking up too. Say, oh, I want to be a soul winner. I want to impact people with the gospel. Okay, just fall in love with Jesus, and they'll be attracted by the fruitfulness that that bears in your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day and the blessings of being at church. Thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I've always been intrigued by this last discourse recorded by John, the, the longest recorded discourse that we have uh, toward the end of your earthly ministry. So many things that you touched on, so many foundational truths. And Lord, I've tried to touch on a few of them this morning to encourage us to love you back the way you loved us. Lord, it's time for some of us to make, make, a, make a little better effort at loving you and being a friend. Think of the old, old gospel song that says, I'll be a friend to Jesus. May it be true of us and true of Bethel Baptist Church. Lord, I pray this morning in all these different aspects, uh, fellowship. Some of us just need, to, just need to deal with some issues of life that have kept us from really having the sweetness and closeness with our Heavenly Father, and the Heavenly Son, the Heavenly Spirit, and even with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that fellowship would be restored today because we've heard from the lips of our Savior. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be a friend to you and be fruitful for you. And Lord, that uh, we'd be willing to follow you. We think of another old song that says, I will follow where he leadeth. I will pasture where he feedeth. Thank you for old brother Weigel. Though his heart was broken, though his wife forsook him, he took his little daughter away from him, he loved you still. And he wanted to follow you. May we have a commitment like that to love you. And Lord, I pray this morning, then we'd enjoy the fullness of life, just like you designed Christianity to be not full of agitation and worries and doubts and troubles. Though, we have, though we're not exempt from the problems of life, may we in and through the problems of life enjoy peace beyond understanding, love so deep beyond comprehension. Uh, may we enjoy, Lord, the joy of the Lord. May it be our strength. 
we pray this morning that we might know what the filling of the Holy Spirit really is. We pray for that fullness. Lord, if there's someone here that's unsaved, they've certainly heard testimony of the gospel this morning. They've heard about Jesus, our Savior, going to Calvary. And I pray, Lord, that they would fall in love with you, that they would love you back because you first loved them enough to die, not while they were good enough, but while they were yet sinners. And maybe even someone under the sound of my voice is here this morning and feels like they're too big a sinner to be saved. And Lord, we're thankful for the testimony of Scripture. It tells us that even Paul, toward the end of his ministry, still counted himself to be the chiefest of sinners. And yet you loved him and saved him and used him in an unusual way. Maybe someone would be the next Paul. Maybe someone this morning feeling like Paul did. I've, I've gone too far in the wrong direction. I could, never, I could never recover from this. And humanly speaking, they're right. But spiritually speaking, there's a God in heaven who loves to do the impossible. We know the disciples once asked, Lord, uh, who then can be saved? And you said, oh, anybody can be saved because with God, all things are possible. The reason anybody can be saved is the same reason I was able to be saved as a second year Bible college student between my second and third year of Bible college. Lord, you saved me. Not because I was a Bible college student, not because I studied the Bible, not because I ran a bus route, not because I'd cleaned my outside life up. You saved me because I was a sinner. You saved me because you loved me just like I was. Thank you for loving me and saving me. Would you save someone today? Would you stir our hearts as believers? May someone make some fresh vows today and not let you go unloved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together with us this morning? We'll have just a brief time of invitation. I usually use that word brief. In other words, it's never my intent to drag an invitation out. If the Lord were to step in and uh, begin to move and things were happening for His honor and glory, I'm not going to be the one to step up here and say, no, we've got to go home. <laughs> but you understand, it's not my intention to drag this invitation out. If, you, if God's spoken to your heart, stirred something in your, in your heart, in your mind, just step out by faith and do business with God. There are kneeling benches down front. We call our old-fashioned altar. No one's going to think less of you for using an old-fashioned altar to rededicate your life to God, to express some renewal of vows to Him, to get your friendship back in order with Him, to pledge your fellowship, to get your fullness back, whatever the need may be. And it all starts with God commending His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you're not certain of your eternity, come to Him. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Quit trying to save yourself. Come to Him and let Him save you this morning. As we sing our song, would you come?
express my appreciation for you being in church this morning. We do have another opportunity this afternoon. Uh, we'll have a service at 6 o'clock. We have prayer meetings before that, a men's and ladies' separate prayer meetings there. So if you'd like to join us for prayer time at 5.30. And uh, then I heard something about a mention of our Bethel Boys Senior uh, group uh, meeting for practice. So guys, uh, don't forget about that. Uh, get together this afternoon and... Uh, and I was getting ready to say it like I've heard others say it and run over a few songs. I, I, I don't know if that's a good way to put that or not. Amen. Uh, but thankful, thankful for folks that love the Lord and want to sing and, uh, and play instruments to His honor and glory. And uh, so we look forward to the service tonight. And uh, again, we covet your prayers for um, our grandson, Caden, and his upcoming surgery and for our travel and time to be with our kids there. Uh, it's our oldest son and uh, his wife and our grandson and granddaughter uh, all involved there in Rochester, Minnesota. I feel like I'm going into a foreign country to be a missionary this coming week. Amen. And uh, so you pray for us. We'll be taking plenty of plenty of. Uh, well, I got to be careful what I say. I, I, we're on uh, online. It might be misunderstood. I was getting ready to say we're going to take plenty of ammunition with us, but I don't want that to be misunderstood. I'm talking about gospel tracks. Amen. <laughs> uh, so looking for, looking forward to what the what the Lord uh, will do and blessing I'm praying for my grandson that God will not only fix his heart I'm praying that spiritually he'll get his heart and Caden has a soft heart for the Lord but uh, I just want the Lord to uh, to use this experience in his life and help him and bless him not only physically but spiritually let's pray as we dismiss Father again we thank you for the good day thank you for these dear folks that have assembled in your name Lord, thank you for those who are visiting with us today. We do pray that you'd bless their families and their folks. And Lord, we are thankful uh, for your, your blessing to bring us to this hour, bring us to this place. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, watch over us and help us with our needs, that we in turn might be a blessing and a help to others. And Lord, as I preached this morning, I pray in my own heart and my own life, Lord, that I'll just keep that love light shining and that love and commitment to you uh, priority and preeminent and above all others. Lord, I want to love you with my whole heart. I want to give you everything that I've got. Like you said in, in speaking of the great commandment, you said it is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. Lord, I pray that'd be true. Somebody get a hold of that little truth today and begin to love God, love our Savior back the way you loved us. We pray it, Lord, in your name, the lovely name of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.